All right, BMX fans, welcome to episode two of the BMX Commentator Podcast. My name is Rich Eames, I'm your host, racing and world championship commentator. Delighted to bring you another guest today, but before we get to that, just want to do a little bit of housekeeping. There's something that I really wanted to say, and it's to everybody who took the time to download, to listen to episode one. Um, I'm genuinely grateful for your support. Thank you very much. I got so many nice comments DMs, people sharing it on Instagram and on Facebook and things of that nature. And to get that support for a brand new podcast is absolutely fantastic. I am so grateful. So if you've taken the time to be with the BMX Commentator podcast from the start, thank you, thank you, thank you. And I look forward to bringing you many more podcasts in the future. But on to business today, and we've got guest number two. You may have seen my mention of it on uh, Instagram earlier in the week. I'm delighted to bring our second guest and somebody I've been very keen to speak to. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the podcast, Drew Polk. Drew, how are you, sir? How are you doing? I'm doing fantastic. How are you doing? Good. Yes, very well. Thank you. I believe you're still in Rock Hill after the weekend. Yes, sir. Yeah, it's been a few extra days here. Try to get some lap time in um, while I can. Uh, Don't want to have to make the drive too many times, so figured I'd stay here, make the most out of my time. Yeah, getting that extra preparation in for the Worlds. Well, hopefully we can make the team. So, I mean, it's kind of over at this point. All the petitions are in. So I'm not sure if we beat enough, but um, we'll see. Yeah, I keep forgetting about the selection part because obviously you've now gone from under 23 to elite, which is something I actually wanted to talk to you about anyway. So Mm. how does that situation work? Do they just select a team? How many spaces have Team USA got for the Worlds in elite? So we have four, and I think it's four all across the the men's side of the American teams. Um, and then our women do really good, so they have, I think, five. But, yeah, elite men, we have four. Okay, okay. Well, it's uh, obviously it's a tough, tough team to get into at any time, but certainly leading into an Olympics is going to be tough. But we can come back to the kind of amateur to pro transition side a little bit later on because it was certainly one of those things I wanted to chat about. But yeah, mainly kind of my introduction to Drew Polk was via YouTube. So, um, you know, I'm an avid YouTube watcher, spend more time watching YouTube, I think, than I do watching regular television these days. And um, obviously the the almighty algorithm does suggest (laughs) stuff to you. So, um, yeah, I think I started watching your channel well over a year ago. In fact, how long has the channel actually been running, Drew? Um, So I made it at the very end of 2018. I did a little recap of the year and then 2019 it was when i was really consistent with it um and then it kind of just evolved from there so yeah i guess end of 2018 okay so certainly longer than i've been watching i didn't actually realize it had been going on for that long so now you've kind of mentioned that is video something you've always been interested in you seem to have a a a natural kind of skill set towards that style of things is that correct yeah 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 i've kind of i was i kind of grew up around the youtube side um not so much like the social media but i don't know i just really enjoyed like video um so i kind of i actually wasn't even allowed to have any social medias until i was a little bit older um but i got it when i was i got youtube when i was 15 like started posting on it um and it's kind of because my parents knew that i kind of had that passion for like making videos and like putting everything together and I thought it was like a really neat way to kind of just do recaps of all the weekends and um kind of just put everything out there instead of just like a little Instagram post so um yeah I don't know I've always been fascinated with like the the video side YouTube the longer form stuff okay okay well that sounds good because obviously you're like you said before you're very very consistent with your YouTube and you put videos out regularly after each race and I follow the USA BMX National Series as well as I follow pretty much everything else. So I know that after a national, chances are I was going to see one of your videos. I can't actually remember the first video of yours I actually watched, but the first one that sticks in my mind was the, I think it was the day in the life of a high school student. Oh, yeah. That one. So that was the one that sprung to mind because my son is also an avid watcher of yours, and I think that was the first video he watched. And he watched it about 15 times. So, yeah, <laughs> you've, you've spent a lot of time in my living room, Drew, without you even knowing it. That's so, so, yeah. So going back to the first video that you ever made, what was it and how many views did it get? Um, so it was a 2018 recap. Um, so 
it was it was a pretty action packed year. It went from basically being a nobody to I got a few podiums at the nationals and then won my first national and then got picked up on the team I'm still on actually LSG with Donovan Long. Um, and so I kind of went through all my podiums through the year and then played all my, like my grand stuff, like the, the rock and then the grands, obviously. Um, and I, I was also in the nag five challenge. So then basically the whole entire year in like, I don't know, it's like 15 minutes plus like a bunch of me talking after, which looking back, it's, it's funny to see how far I've come with like just talking in front of a camera, but, uh, no, it, it's like a, it's just a cool video to look back on, but I'm not actually sure how many views it has. Um, I'm pretty sure it's over a thousand. Um, I'm not sure. No, it's decent that for a you know for a first video. You know, when you're a young lad just go, getting into the YouTube side of things, and you're spending the time putting the work in and putting these things together, it's you know it's it's validation of your work. And and I think I don't know if you'll agree me, with me on this, but if as a young teenager like that, if you've got the ability a to put those videos together, it's a it's a technical skill set that you can utilize you know, in other areas of your life, but also as well to, to be brave enough to stand up there and, and deliver to camera anything, you know, vaguely resembling a speech of any description. Again, that's another skill set that you're building. So it's it's testament to, you, you know, your bravery because a lot of teenage kids would not stand in front of a camera and, and speak. It, it wouldn't work for some kids. So mm. the fact that you were doing that very early on, I think is is phenomenal. So, yeah, yeah it's great. Yeah, thank you. I, uh, I I wasn't very good at it when I first started. Um, admittedly, I'd I'd always go to where nobody was standing, not in front of people. So like I'd set up a tripod, a tripod like just back in the the back of the parking lot and just talk like at the national, just like a an intro and an outro, just get some talking. Um, but then it kind of evolved a bit, and then I want to say it was around. 2020 2021 those two years i started talking a bit more and now it's kind of i'm pretty comfortable just talking in front of people i'll just be walking through just the the track and talking from my gopro my camera whatever um it's gotten a lot easier and especially getting more recognition with it and um people knowing that i do it anyways it comes second nature so yeah it's nice now yeah i was actually going to ask you about the fan interaction you know, because obviously your channel is gaining some traction now and people are starting to recognize who you are and that kind of thing, because obviously you were in Glasgow and the, um, we went to Glasgow and, uh, you know, we met, you had my son with me and, and the first two people he wanted to meet were you and Barry Nobles. And that's <laughs> totally down to the power of YouTube. Mm -hmm. So, you know, when he was a kid, he started by watching Neat Kimmon videos for breakfast before he went to school it was a bowl of cereal and an eat kimmon video and then that's now grown he's watching you he's watching barry um anybody who puts any consistency into their youtube seems to make it into the rotation which i think is 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 quite good um i mean in terms of your sponsors and that kind of thing you know the people that you ride for you know you ride for lsg you've been with them for a while do they see like big value in what you're doing with youtube um, I think there's definitely a bit of value to that. Um, I think it's definitely helped with like some of the other sponsors like box. Um, I, I know they do like a lot of the media stuff, but a lot of the sponsors don't really, I don't want to say take advantage of it, but they don't necessarily focus on that. Um, and I think a lot of it comes down to just you as a writer, like how well you do. Um, cause you can be like the best person in social media. And if you're not going to win races, get podiums, a team over here, at least probably won't like you won't be much good for the team because um, we're really based on team scores. So I, I think over here, not as much, but I think it does come as like a byproduct and I, I think they see it, but I don't think it's like a huge, like, like people just go after me for it. Yeah. Right. Okay. Cause I kind of put you down in what I would describe as the new, new school where you've got to almost have a 360 degree presence as a rider. By that, I mean, you know, you've got to be winning races. You've got to be approachable with the kids. You've got to have that social media side. Um, I was listening to uh, a podcast today with Caroline Buchanan on, um, and she was saying that, you know, her whole marketing and media strategy developed from being 10 years old, and that built all the way through her career. And that's the reason she's been able to be as successful as she can, because she's been focused on that marketing side. And like you say, it used to be a, a situation where 
you know, a rider could just win races and that would be enough and sign a few autographs. And I don't think that's the case anymore. I think you've got to be more of a complete marketing um, entity, I suppose is the best way to describe it. Would you agree with that? Do you have a different viewpoint on it? No, yeah, I, I really agree with that. Um, I know Caroline has done really well with her presence and just how good she is as a persona. Like, she's awesome. Um, and I think a lot of it also has to do with how you interact with people off the screen. Like, when kids come up to me, um, I'm always – I try to be as approachable as I can. I mean, sometimes – when I'm like just getting off a lap and I can't even breathe and someone like, like the kids are trying to talk to me, it gets like a little tough and I have to like be like, all right, just give me like five seconds. I'll like, just let me cool down. But I try to always be as the best I can because um, some people don't have the best interactions with some of the top pros and then it really drives them away. Um, I've, I've had parents tell me that when they come up to me as well. So um, I think being like more real, like I feel like I'm pretty similar to the kids as I am on my videos. Um, so I don't think there's like a difference in that. And I think just that kind of relationship with the, the writers, the fans, all that, the kids is a huge part of it. Yeah. Cause there was a, there used to be a saying, don't ever meet your heroes because sometimes <laughs> you end up disappointed, but we yeah. live in an age now where, you know, a kid's sporting heroes are more accessible than they've ever been. Thanks to social media. I mean, I certainly remember meeting some of my, favorite riders growing up and and to be fair most of them were really cool but i can absolutely guarantee you there's a few out there that probably aren't as cool with the kids as they would like kids would think they would be but yep. yeah i don't think in this day and age you can afford to be as a rider you've got to be approachable because if you're not approachable by the same token that news will get out on social media pretty quick so i think mm -hmm. you know elite riders have now got to almost think about what they're doing before they kind of interact with the fans but you know that's yeah. uh, that's another conversation for for another time <laughs> um yeah because uh, i think one of the other things that i wanted to ask was as well especially with regards to um your kind of work on youtube because i know you're at college at the minute aren't you is that correct yeah yeah i'm in my last semester i'm finishing up college all right okay so you're nearly ready to finish which college yeah. are you at uh, i'm doing it through snhu um, I do it online now, so it's through Southern New Hampshire University. It's been really cool, actually. All right, okay, because you were at one of the cycling kind of based universities, if I remember correctly, from some yeah. of your videos. Yeah, yeah. How was. was that for you? It was all right. It was just like a little bit of um, conflict of interest and uh, just felt like I had more passion for the BMX side and they kind of had more passion for just being a cyclist and doing all the other disciplines and they kind of wanted it their way. And then I just have a different, a different path that I want to take. And so I figured it'd be best to kind of go on my own route. And I don't think it really would have added too much to my resume, my future, any of that stuff. So I think it's a lot better the way I'm doing it now. Right. Okay. Cause I seem to remember a video where you were on a, a race weekend with the college and you were doing dual slalom. Is that right? Yeah. 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 There were a few like mountain bike races. Okay, so that just wasn't uh, it wasn't flipping the switch, was it? It was just BMX all the way through. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I really just want to put all my eggs in the BMX basket, but yeah, I don't know. It was okay. it was fun while I was there, but I don't think it was that great. Okay, all right. But for some people, that would be a great route. I'm not gonna lie. Um, yeah, yeah. For some people, think, it'd be really good. Yeah, I think has Felicia Stansel gone that route? I think she went to college. She went to one of those colleges, if I remember correctly. Yeah, she went to the same one that I was at. Yeah. Ah, right. Okay. I knew there was a connection there somewhere. I just couldn't remember mm. what it was. So with that in mind, your college degree, is that related to what you're doing with YouTube? Is it something to do with video? Um, I was thinking about it, but um, I'm kind of doing some videography, um, content creation stuff on the side as well. Um, I do like part-time work for them, but uh, I can kind of build that without the degree really. Um, mainly like the for like film and film school all that stuff it's mainly for connections uh and i'm not really at the point in like my career where i would be willing to give up that much time to go and be in person all day every day um because obviously i miss days such as this entire week but um uh, i'm doing business right now so i'm doing a concentration in finance and it's kind of just like a, a more broad degree um i've always been kind of fascinated with numbers so i think the finance really helps me and i could definitely use that as an avenue 
Um, and then just having a degree in general and then business is also super applicable to a lot. So kind of just given me a few different options. But I think when I'm done with BMX, I really want to do the videography side of it, um, which, again, I don't really need a degree for it. Just kind of have to have work that people desire to have. So, yeah, just generate results for people. So, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So you said you were, had a, a side gig working for somebody else doing video stuff. And I think I saw a glimpse of that on one of your videos. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Yeah. So I work for a company called Vance and Hines Motorsports. Um, they're right near my house. It's like 15 minutes, but they do, um, they do motorcycle racing. So they do drag racing and then they also do, um, NH, um, sorry, not NHRI. That's the drag racing Moto America. So they have, um, some bagger racing that they do and then also um some other stuff on the side so it's a it's really cool cool to be in a different side of racing and get to capture some of that Uh, i do more of the in-house stuff so like all the product videos photos all that kind of stuff but um i'm hoping to get some of the races be able to capture some of that i think it'd be really cool Ah, you just prompted my next question. I was going to ask you, actually, if you went to any of the events. So I think it would be cool because obviously it would give you a a viewpoint into a completely different sport and also as well give you an opportunity to kind of broaden your content that you're actually putting out for the BMX because, you know, anything on two wheels, I'm pretty sure your BMX audience would be into and it gives them an opportunity to see what you do away from the bike, which I think is is quite good. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. Um, In terms of, like, the videos that you're producing, obviously we see more of your race vlogs with the point of view footage and that kind of thing, and you've done quite a few of them now. Um, How long does it take you to put a race vlog together once the weekend's over? Um, It kind of depends on, A, how long the weekend is, and, B, how much I want to put into it. Um, Some races, like the Worlds, I kind of put – a bit more into it, like make it more detailed, make it super like perfect. Um, but kind of this year, um, I've tried to take a step back cause it's, it was sitting around probably an hour per minute of video. So, I mean, when you're looking at like a, an, an eight minute video, it's like probably six to eight hours of editing, just the editing part. So it gets pretty taxing, but this year, um, I kind of just thought that and I've also done some polls and people just said they'd rather do like less edits and like less perfect and just more content, which makes so much sense as a consumer. Like really you don't care if there's a cool transition or like some cool B roll, like people just want to see like what you're doing. So kind of just putting it together quicker and just getting everything in order so I can put out more. Um, that's kind of been the, the goal. Um, my past video that I just uploaded was probably like, I don't know, three hours of editing. So not too bad for like a whatever 13 minute video okay so you've got that structure down pretty well then yeah yeah i've done it a few minutes uh, <laughs> quite a bit of times <laughs> right okay yeah yeah consistency and speed for the win good i yeah. like that so um in terms of like your inspirations on youtube who inspires you as a youtuber um i really started with neek i watched his videos all the time and unfortunately, he doesn't post as much as I, I think anybody wishes because his videos are so good. Um, so I kind of wanted to do something similar, but obviously not copy him completely. Um, but just showcasing all the races because nobody over here in the U.S. kind of did that. Like Jeremy Smith was kind of on and off with it. And then Barry's obviously doing really well right now. Uh, when I started, Barry wasn't really making USA BMX videos. But um, kind of just showcasing all the videos because I would notice you'd put out a national video and people would just be all over it because they, they search up like the race and there's nothing really about it besides the USA BMX live stream. Um, so I think it's cool to give people like the GoPro point of views because everyone wants to see the track and then just seeing like racing in general. So, and I think that along with also building my name, now people look for me, look for the race, look for just anything. So, um, all that combined, but yeah, I think it really stemmed from Neek. Um, and yeah yeah he's certainly the original i think when it comes to kind of bmx race content he was certainly you know a staple in our house for a very very long time and and even now i've got notifications on for neek as well so as soon as he drops a new video i watch all his stuff as well so Mm -hmm. i am a proper proper bmx geek and (laughs) you know i like to i like to know what's going on with the athletes because obviously with the commentary and all that kind of stuff it gives you something to talk about but but yeah i think any rider who is 
you know, consistent enough. And I think that is the key word, consistent, because they don't, you'll, you'll see quite a few people who start a YouTube channel and then they'll do two videos and drop away. But the likes mm-hmm. of yourself, Neek, Justin, uh, Barry, um, I'd like to see more stuff from the likes of uh, Jay Skippers as well. The yeah, Dutch rider, he, he used to do quite oh, a few. His quality is, I think, unmatched. It's so good. Yeah, yeah, and uh, Mathis Rago Richard as well, the French yep, rider. Yep. He does some really good videos as well. So, yeah, I am I am all over that that content when it drops. So, yep. yeah, it's um, always a pleasure to watch. So, with um, like our young BMXers who want to start a channel, would would you give any advice to would be BMX YouTubers? Yeah, I think it's just start and do it. Like, um, I didn't have any crazy like expectations with it i kind of just started putting them together for myself and i think still to this day if nobody watched i would still put together my laps because it's funny you go back and watch laps that you forget even happened and then like all these memories pop up so really it was for myself um obviously i'm not saying that i don't post for other people now because i wouldn't talk to the camera the way i do if people weren't watching but just post for yourself and then like i started with just posting my mains like i'd post i literally post three videos it'd be the main of each day friday saturday sunday with a little title friday main saturday main sunday main like it doesn't take much and people really want to watch that stuff so just start at one point and then it'll progress like if you go back and watch my videos from 2019 it would be like people are pretty amazed at how much better they've gotten so you progress just over time yeah if you progress with the quality of the equipment that you're using as well yeah yeah big time yeah i started with my iphone i would just i would film on my iphone edit on my iphone and now there's people that can edit amazingly on the iphone with like cap cut and all that stuff like there's some really good software out there now which i didn't really have back then but you can do some really good stuff just with your phone so like it, it doesn't have to be super complicated now i have a big old computer i have a camera multiple cameras the drone whatever so it's it's built over time everything has really grown yeah, yeah. No, that's good. I believe Beth Shriver does all her vlogs on an iPhone and edits mm-hmm. it on an iPhone as well. Beth yeah. has told me that in the past. And the quality of what she's putting out is really good as well. Yeah, I forgot yeah. about Beth's vlog, actually. That's another one that's, uh, you know, on the rotation for me. So, mm-hmm. so yeah, and anybody who does that. Oh, Saya Sakakibara as well. Her videos are spot on. Yeah. I really enjoy yeah. Saya's content as well. So, so, yeah, there are some people doing it really well. And I'd certainly drop you in that category. So, um, so yeah, uh, I'm trying to think if I've got any other questions with regards to YouTube. I can't think of any off the top of my head. So what I'll do is I'll switch gears slightly in that I also wanted to chat to you about the transition from going to amateur into the pro class because you know, you were a top amateur, you've won national number one arm, you've 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 been as far as you can go with that. So I think probably starting there would be a good thing. So just kind of sum up the end of your amateur career kind of like that from, you know, winning number one arm and then the year after which I think did Brody Cole win the title in two thousand and twenty three? Yeah. He did. Right. Okay. So yeah, just give us a bit of an insight into like, you know, winning that number one amateur because it's the most coveted title in USA BMX outside of obviously winning a pro title. Mm -hmm. How was winning number one amateur for you? Yeah, that was a really cool one. Um, I think a lot of people go into it. Like I never really expected to get it. Um, And a lot of people don't even know that it's like possible. And coming from the year before, it really wasn't like an amazing year and I really stepped it up going into grands and like that's still my best race to this day which is crazy because it was three years ago and I felt nowhere near as prepared um but did really well at that grands and then it was kind of like well now we have like a shot at it like I didn't even think this would be possible but we went into the year and kind of dominated like I won I'm pretty sure over 50 percent of the races that I raced um and With my riding style, I was hole shotting a lot more, which is pretty unusual. Um, That wasn't my strong point. So it was cool to, like, kind of progress through that. Um, And then, obviously, didn't win the Grands, but we had a ton of foreigners, fast guys coming over. But still, like, got the title, which was cool. And then it was kind of like a decision of, should I go pro? Should I stay am? Um, The way we kind of looked at it, I wasn't sure I was really ready yet. Like, I didn't really win the main. So still had some work to do, obviously. And then... Um, it's always a good thing if you can have a shot at more titles and getting two would be insane. So 
kind of decided to stay one more year. And we were kind of talking about last night. If they were still like have a pro or if U23 wasn't a class, um, I probably would have went up. But um, yeah, try to try to spend another year in in 1720. And I'm glad I did because I went through some struggles and learned how to get past those. So um, that was definitely a really big growing season just like the first half of it um kind of got back in the swing of things started winning a bit more and then halfway through the season i thought it was kind of going to be a bust and just kind of go in um try to win grands whether i got the title whether i got nag 10 like it really didn't matter to me i just wanted to win the grands um but then got myself into a good position going in had a shot at it and then still tried to win it um came up a little short i i thought i was going to have something in it if i got to that first turn clean but um Got pushed over that turn, and then, um, yeah, we decided we were going to go pro, obviously. I'm not going to run 21-25 amateur. Um, it's not really a big class in the U.S., so decided to go pro for that one. Um, and then I've, I've gotten the question, why didn't I race U23? Um, kind of, It's kind of a simple one. Um, we only had, well, it looked like we were going to have two Olympic spots, and only one guy had any points. So anything can really happen on the elite stage, and I've seen that very clear on the the first four that I did. Um, So gave it a shot. And I mean, technically it's not over yet, but with how the points are looking, I'm pretty much out of it at this point, but um, give it a shot. And I I figured worst case scenario, I was going to be racing with the top guys and improving at a much faster rate. And I've seen it from all the amateurs here that go like, let's say, like take me where I stayed and raced amateur 2023, whatever, versus the guys that went to the elite class, they progress much quicker, which is, kind of crazy because even though they're getting beat they're still progressing faster than i was um so i think just racing in that higher tier um just makes you so much better and you learn so much and i've really seen that as well so worst case scenario was still better than i think would have been in u23 because at the end of the day like a u23 world title whatever world plate is really really cool and everyone wants one but um that's not like the end career goal for me so i had to give it a shot at the olympics even if i came up short Okay. Okay. Well, that's a very honest answer. Thank you for that. Yeah. I appreciate it. I mean, I know we've gone back and forward on this on Instagram before now, but can you explain the difference between riding under 23 and riding in elite? What's easier, what's harder, what you have to look out for, the biggest differences that you've noticed between those two classes, under 23 and elite? Yeah, so... I'll take it back a little bit. Um, 2021 Worlds, when I got World 3, that was kind of like the, the spark of it. And I was like, okay, we're going to be doing some international racing. Like, that's the next step. Um, so 2022, we started doing the World Cups, and it became very clear. Anything on the World Cup level, international level, you have to be perfect. Like, if I, I kind of noticed if I would case a jump, you're not just getting – you slow down or getting passed by maybe one person like in the U S you're getting passed by two, three guys from a case. And then you're losing more speed going even farther back. Well, I've improved on that, but then going into the elite class, it's even crazier. Like I basically have to be perfect to make it out of motos, which I don't have the, the raw speed that everyone has right now down the first straight. So I can't just rely on, you know, maybe making a mistake, still getting through. Like I really have to be perfect and ride very, very smart. Um, so right now that's like the current thing is just you have to be perfect and not make mistakes. And then the other one is the the racing is a lot tighter. Like in U23, you kind of had some room, like nobody was super bunched up. You have eight guys in the gate that are all going to be like this. And like even if you get cut off, you still have to stay in their wheel basically to even have a shot. So uh, it's been a, a huge learning curve of staying close and being aggressive with it still. So um, definitely lo- watching lots of uh, Carlos Ramirez. He's crazy good with it, and he blows my mind with how good he is. But um, watching that and kind of trying to learn how he does that. Yeah, I think you mentioned to me as well when we went back and forward on Instagram about trust in the other riders around you. Is that mm-hmm. a big thing? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's a, another one. Um, it's not like we're in U23 where – it may be their first, second year, even on the big hill. Um, there's just less experience in the U23 class and a lot more mistakes, as I was mentioning. Um, but elite, I mean, you're racing guys that have been doing it for decades, so they typically don't make many mistakes. And if they do, it's very controlled. So like going into a turn, you can pretty much trust that they're going to take a, a good line through the turn and not make a sporadic like swerve. So you kind of have to use that to your advantage and, use that to stay closer to them. 
Okay. Okay. Cool. That sounds good. Who are the people that you like? Obviously, you're kind of in early doors now with the elite racing. But is there anybody who has stood out to you as like somebody you would you've really enjoyed racing against? And what would the reasons for that be? Um, I mean, I haven't raced a ton because, I mean, realistically, I haven't gotten that far in the World Cups to race as many people as I'd hoped. Um, but I think just racing like over here in the states, it's it's kind of that same concept of there's not as many of them, so I can get closer to them. So in, like, Sarasota, I was able to kind of race up front with the guys more because you didn't have as many people in between the, the top guys and the, I mean, I guess I'm at the bottom, so bottom guys. But, um, yeah, it's been cool, like, I don't know, mixing it up with, like, Jeremy Smith and um, all the U.S. guys. I mean, Carlos Ramirez was there in Sarasota. Um, Joey Lito kind of. I don't know. They're all really good riders. So just mixing it up with them, even if they're beating me, like it's cool to be that close and learning from it. Yeah. Yeah. I'm glad you mentioned Joey Lito actually, because there was a question I wanted to ask you. I noticed on your Brisbane video that I think you and Joey were kind of like hanging out together between races and quote unquote pitting together, mm-hmm. but it just looked like all your stuff had been dumped at the side of the track. Were you not under a tent anywhere? Did you have anywhere to shelter? It was just something I noticed and I thought, well, that's a bit odd. <laughs> Let me just ask that question. What What was going on with that at Brisbane? Yeah. So um, we kind of got the news that we weren't going to get like any support when we went to the like overseas. Um, usually they offer like a little package where you can just pay for it through USA Cycling and then they can use that money to get whatever is needed. But that wasn't really offered. It was kind of only for the people that they thought were like the Olympic hopefuls. Um, so Joey and I, and then also Brody Cole, we kind of got together and made some like arrangements together. Um, New Zealand was a tough one and we kind of had the same thing. We we're pitting out at the back of a, a truck outside of the facility. Uh, and then Brisbane, there, we didn't really have that option, and the fans were also a lot bigger, so going in and out really wasn't a huge possibility. But we kind of found, like, a little curb and just put our stuff there. And it was we got lucky because it looked like it was going to rain on both race days, and we would have been absolutely screwed. Um, but then we also had some other guys sitting on there, which it's even crazier. Like, yeah, I'm there, but then you have – I saw Mathis Rago Richard was there, Bias was there, and like they've made World Cup mains and they're sitting on the curb. Like it's just crazy going into an Olympic year. The the federations and all the countries are a lot more tight. Um, so it's just tough, but you gotta do what you gotta do and then just hopefully you do good enough to where you don't have to be in that position next time. Okay, because I seem to recall like from going to World Cups in the past that there was some form of open pit area where non-federation riders could kind of put their stuff and you know hang out together and and have like a base to work from does that because i haven't been to a world cup in person this year is that not the case anymore is that not available um in rotorua there was one it was like three pits there were like three tents um but there were i i don't even think i would have had a spot to put my stuff to be honest um so i think it was just better to just sit where there's at least a little bit of open space um it was it was packed so there's definitely there wasn't enough room for comfort at least so i I don't know i would have rather just been on the curb wasn't too big of a deal okay fair enough fair enough um you have actually touched on something that i wanted to ask you about which was the funding for world cups and world champs and you said like there used to be a bit of a package that they put together so has that been without wanting to throw anybody under the bus has that been scrapped now if they changed the way they fund things because sometimes like you've been to races where we've seen you in a usa jersey which obviously means that you're funded and then races where you're not in usa kit which i take it that you're not fun- uh, that you're not funded so how does that funding scenario work for you and then is it just you paying for it out of your own pocket do the sponsors help you out how does that work yeah so they have um the funding is kind of laid out and the criteria is tough. Like just keeping it real. It's, it's tough to even get in there. Um, I got world three from 2021. So I ended up on, I guess technically it would be the gold tier, but since I was moving up to U23, I think it put me like bronze or silver tier, which is like, I got my races paid for flights paid for, um, basically everything paid for on those trips. Um, so I wore the U S Jersey and then I, I didn't really get any funding after worlds that year because I didn't do great. So kind of had to go to Bogota on my own. Um, still wore the U.S. jersey because they had some, like, grants being offered. So kind of did that. And then heading into 2023, it was like, 
I had only really made one main, so I think I missed uh, making, I guess, the national team or um, getting any funding by, like, a couple World Cup ranking spots. Um, so I just wore my own stuff because I'm going to support the people that support me. So wear my stuff for all those. Didn't do amazing. Um, and then I didn't even go to Argentina because I just wanted to stay back, put in some work. Um, and then this year, obviously, racing my own stuff, no support either. So it's tough. But, um, yeah, I've had a few sponsors help me out. Um, Ericsson Spray Foam has really been a big one that's helped me a ton. And then, obviously, like, Box, Send It. Um, and then even through my team here in the U.S., they've helped me a bit. So, um, yeah, it's been it's, – it's all right. We're still getting to the races. I only have this time once in my life, so I'm not going to waste it. i got to get there somehow. That's a good philosophy to have for sure. Definitely, definitely. Um What's the biggest surprise from moving up to Elite? Is there anything where you thought, you know, you had an expectation on how things would be and it's not been like that at all? It's been something different. Is there anything that's actually shocked you about going up to the Elite class? Um, It's kind of gone two ways. So I went into it knowing that really anything can happen and I'm at the speed where I can be close enough to capitalize on anything like that. Um. And you see guys that you can almost compare yourself to and they make mains and you're like, well, I could definitely do that. But it kind of, it takes a lot and you have to be feeling amazing on the race day. Like everything kind of has to go your way. So, I mean, really the, the laps don't get easier. Like my first rounds were basically equivalent to the, my eighth final that I made in Rotorua. Like the rounds, you're going to have seven other fast guys to beat. So it, it really doesn't change, and you just have to be so perfect. Um, then on the flip side, you know, you kind of have these guys on a pedestal, and you're like, well, they're like the top of the top. Like, I don't know if I could even beat them. And I kind of surprised myself being closer than I not really expected, but I, I didn't really have, like, an expectation going into it. But um, I was I was pretty close. So just, like, having that in mind and knowing that, like, Obviously, I have a bit of work to do to get on to that level, but um, it's not like I'm two straights back or whatever. Like, it's I'm still in like range, so it's it's kind of cool to be that not super close, but to be close enough. Close enough, right? Okay, which kind of leads me into my next question, I suppose. Um, obviously, from being an amateur moving into the elites your training's going to change. And obviously you've posted some stuff on your videos lately where you've been doing different things as regards training. So just kind of speak to that a little bit in terms of how you used to train versus how you train now and the changes that you've made and the things that you've had to do to kind of be more competitive. Yeah, um, I think in the amateur and especially on the USA VMAX side, it's really all about the first straight, like, if you get to the first turn first, you're going to have a much better shot at winning. Um, and the thing for me is I don't really need to be first to the first turn. I just need to be in a top three because I can make a move or two around the track. So just getting myself into like a, a fighting position going into the first turn. So it was like a lot about that. But then moving to the elite class, like I've kind of had this mindset, like if I'm going to like the only way you can hole shot every single lap is by being the fastest person on the planet. Like that's the only way. So not taking less or not putting in less emphasis on the first straight, but kind of in, um, involving a lot more and also doing some track work because uh, I kind I felt like I had pretty good track speed from like U23 and amateur racing, but then going to the elite class, the guys are just good everywhere. Like they're better than I am everywhere. So kind of have to work on everything all at once. So still kind of keeping the same training philosophy that really has come from my coach, Donovan Long, um, really number-based and just pushing your numbers. Like if you're 1% better than you were yesterday and then the next session you're 1% better than that, eventually it's going to compound and you're going to be a lot better. So um, still kind of doing that, but then trying to get more um, high-speed action as well. So kind of like how I'm staying here an extra week after Rock Hill. Like I don't have this style of track back at home. And that's really our main focus right now is getting me to places where I can get this quality training on the big tracks, um, get that leg speed up, everything. So um, really lacking on the experience side for sure. The guys have been doing it longer than I have. So just need to get more experience, more time on these tracks and get better all around. Okay. Do you see yourself, because obviously you're based in Indiana, do you see yourself moving somewhere else within the U.S. to kind of 
continue your career and get that training that you need on the big tracks? Do you see yourself moving to a Rock Hill or a Sarasota or something like that? Do you think that'll happen in the end? Yeah, so I kind of had talks of doing like an apartment down at um, Florida, um, kind of in between Sarasota and Oldsmar because two really good tracks. And then you have a ton of amazing tracks down in Florida. Um, and I was kind of thinking about it and um, I'm trying to put together this thing right now. I'm building a van right now. So I want to do kind of not even like van life, like living in it, but having a vehicle that I could take and stay anywhere. So if I had to go to Chula and ride for a week or whatever, I could take my van there and I have a place to stay. Um, I could go down to Florida and I could go to Rock Hill. Like I can go to any of the tracks. Um, and I think that that life's kind of fascinating. So, um, yeah, hopefully we have my van done. I'm hoping for June, July, um, but sometime this summer and then just basically try to be at the supercross tracks as much as I can. Just try to get more time on it. Okay. Well, that's, that's a whole other level of YouTube content that because once you bring van life into the equation, the views on those kind of videos are going to be absolutely massive. So it might have the effect of pushing your YouTube to the next level. Yeah. Hopefully we can kind of use that to my advantage. Kind of yeah, please, bring in please a new... Tell- I was going to say, please tell me you've been recording the process for a vlog. Um, well, the process we've had so far hasn't been super exciting, but once we get to like the the nice stuff, we'll we'll definitely do some filming with that. Okay, that's that's interesting. I would be very keen to watch that, Drew. Very yeah, keen. yeah, yeah. What kind of van is it? Um, it's a 2011 Sprinter. Okay, okay. Big mileage on it, or is it relatively good? Um, so it was a fleet van, so it had like decently high mileage but it was also taken care of really well um but we actually bought it basically blown up um and i'm rebuilding the motor with my dad so we have it all torn apart but once we get it together i mean essentially it'll have zero miles and the the previous owner replaced a ton on it so it's almost going to be a brand new van and we got it for really cheap so we'll we'll have a a long life to live on it oh right exciting I'm, i'm definitely keen to see that so so, yeah, that's good. Have you got any advice for younger riders then who want to go pro at some point? What would you say to, like, a young rider, 13, 14 years old, his dream is to be a professional BMXer, knowing now what you know after those years of riding amateur, what would you say to any young kid who wants to be a pro BMXer? I think the biggest one, which I've only experienced the USA BMX side, so – this kind of applies to that, but um, really focusing on the skills because as a younger rider, um, you're not as developed and kids hit that, that, that kind of growth spurt at different ages. So for someone like me, I developed later. Um, I was kind of like almost in a hole and like kind of had this feeling of like, well, I'm not like good enough. Like, I don't know if this will work. Cause you start hitting that 14, 15, well, 13, 14, 15 age. And that's kind of when it starts getting serious. So I was kind of nearing it like 12, 13. And I was like, ah, I'm not really sure. But if you really work on the skills, once you do hit your, your growth spurt, you'll just, it'll be so much better than someone who just try to focus on speed the whole time. Cause that comes with that. Um, and that's like one of the most discouraging ones in the USA BMX side, at least because these tracks are, they're flat and it's all about how strong, fast you are. Um, so just building those skills. You see a lot of kids that they just want to win races. Their parents just want them to win races. So they just focus on the the sprints, all this stuff, but just having fun with like riding your bike, enjoying that. Because if you don't enjoy riding your bike, you're not going to have fun with it. If you do have a lot, a long lasting career. So just building really good skills and then focusing on that, that motor, you know, getting fast, all that a little bit later. Um, is, I think that's the best thing is just building those skills and tactics. Okay, so there you go, kids. You've got it from a man who knows. Drew Polk has uh, just told you how to be fast, but also to have fun at the same time. So as we kind of wrap this up, Drew, is there anybody that you want to thank out there? You know, it's your time. You just say what you need to say and thank the people that you need to thank. Yeah, this has definitely been a a really long road, but um, it, it definitely couldn't have been possible without my parents. They've been huge for me, and they're always supporting my dream and I couldn't have done it without them and we're still going. So we got plenty more to go, but also a huge thanks to my coach, Donovan Long. He's stuck with me for so, so long. And he was one of the first people to ever notice any um, potential in me. So uh, I've been with him since 2018, as I mentioned. So we've been together six years and he's still pushing me, still making me better. So it's been awesome. 
And then obviously all my sponsors, um, send it and then LSGs through Donovan. Um, and then box has been a big one as well. Um, and then also, um, I mean, yeah, boxes, they've been like really, really big for me as well. Um, all my parts are basically through them. So that, um, pro start and, uh, yeah, everyone that's really helped me, it's been it's been huge. Erickson Spray Foam as well. They, he's been helping me a ton this year, um, getting me the races. So he's another bit, really big one. Um, 6D, Atlas, Thor. Um, yeah, everyone that helps me this year and in the following years as well. Okay, brilliant, brilliant. Well, that's a, that's a really good spot to uh, leave it, I think, Drew. So uh, thank you for your time, for coming on the podcast. I'm, I'm glad you said yes, because you were definitely on my list of people that I wanted to speak to. So uh, just, you know, have a great rest of the year. We look forward to seeing you getting up there in those elite mains and uh, seeing all that hard work pay off. But most importantly, just, you know, keep doing what you're doing with the YouTube channel, because I know there's a lot of kids out there who love it. And, uh, yeah, I think it's a fabulous thing. So just, you know, you keep doing what you're doing, mate, because it's awesome. Thank you. I appreciate that. Thanks for having me. Okay. No worries. Cheers.